for joining us this evening for the, the launch of the Deliberative Futures uh, Toolkit. Um, and particularly, I suppose, significant is that we're on the eve of the 51st anniversary of the first Earth Day back in, in 1970. So just to give a bit of context, the toolkit is part of a much larger uh, research project called Imagining 2050. Uh, engaging, envisioning and co-producing pathways for a low carbon climate resilient Ireland. My name is German Ali and I'm one of the um, principal investigators on the project. And as you'll see through the evening, um, Imagine 2050 brings together, you know, not just different disciplines uh, across the university, but it also engages uh, beyond that into the community with public bodies and a number of different civil society organizations. Just to give you a little bit of background then in terms of the, how the project emerged, it really was the result of a confluence of a number of different factors, not least the uh, Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, and particularly the Paris Agreement in, in December of 2015 as well. And if you were wondering where the 2050 component of the, the, the name of the project comes from, it is from uh, the, the Paris Agreements. So locally here in UCC, um, we had a number of different uh, elements, including the publication of the sustainability strategy in 2016 and its subsequent integration then right across the various different strategies of the of the university. It was also built on the coming together of a number of different projects where there was a growing realization that with the challenges facing us in the 21st century, uh, really what we were looking at is something that just didn't just require interdisciplinary collaboration, rather it required a more transdisciplinary approach that valued the participation uh, of various different uh, partners in civil society, policy making, state agencies, research, and so on. Nationally, uh, the Irish Citizens' Assembly, and particularly the uh, focus on climate action, has gained international attention. But there's also been a series of climate dialogues nationally and regionally as well that provided, uh, I suppose, the impetus for us to come together. Um, some of the tools that we'll, we'll encounter this evening are over a century old. Um, and have been used very widely in community development or in organizational change processes. Other uh, of the tools have been developed in the context of our partnership with Think Visual. And Think Visual are with us here this evening uh, on the call. And we've adapted some of those tools into the toolkit. So we're delighted to be joined by you here tonight and also particularly by some members of both the Bannon College and the Athlone communities that were instrumental in, in helping to develop many of these tools as well. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Uh, Oliver Escobar, who will reflect on and respond to the presentation made by colleagues and who will introduce properly uh, after we, we go through a very brief overview of the, um, of the toolkit. So we're recording the presentations for the benefit of those who couldn't join us this evening. But as I said, we, we will switch off the recording for the discussion segment. Please, by all means, use the chat function to introduce yourself to uh, other people on the call. Um, we really see this as the, the beginning of a conversation um, more than anything else. So uh, if you wouldn't mind turning off your cameras and, and muting your microphones, we will have uh, colleagues monitoring the chat and, you know, as we go through that, we'll pick up some questions and feed them into a larger discussion in the latter part. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dr. Clodagh Harris, Dr. Alexandra Vez, and Dr. Fionn Rogan to give an overview of some of the tools in the toolkit. Okay. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jar. And it's um, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. So um, I suppose just to give you a sense, I, I'll, I'll talk very briefly about the, the approaches we've taken and um, then pass over to our, col our colleagues. So I suppose our collective response to the climate crisis
Hi, Claudia, you're on mute. Hi, sorry. I was. I, I was. I hope. I hope you heard at the beginning there. So I was just saying that the collective response to the climate crisis requires the involvement of many actors. And it is to these actors that this toolkit is aimed. So it will require involvement of from educators, researchers, activists, local community organisations, social enterprise partnership, partnerships, naturally local and national decision makers and many and many other actors um, the, the list the list we provide here is not exhaustive and we hope that this will be of, of use um, to, to all of these these actors and in the toolkit we very much take a um, a futures thinking, um, a futures oriented approach and coming from the premise that I suppose in order to sustain and enhance democratic decision making in the face of an uncertain and unpredictable future for our society and our environment, that future thinking approaches and tools are required and such approaches I suppose have much to contend so to, commend, to commend them to us because they enable collective visioning, enhance trust and lead towards future oriented communities that are inclusive and empowered. And in the toolkit, um, we propose a form of futures thinking and, and we see many benefits. I, um, I'm not certain who's looking after the slides, but if I could have the next slide, please, that would be that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, on the, um, so there are many benefits um, to adopting a futures thinking approach. We've captured some of them here in this in this image. So, for example, it gives us the opportunity to recognise um, problems and influences that are stemming from the past, to acknowledge the likelihood of unforeseen events, to kind of foresee where possible emerging change, to anticipate and evaluate and monitor um, and revisit existing scenarios and again to explore agency and stakeholder influence um, with a view to kind of promoting alternative preferred futures and ensuring more equitable outcomes. And in the toolkit, we present, I suppose, a suite of tools. We highlight their potential uses and brief instructions, I suppose, on how best to use them. As Ger said, Many of them are quite old. It's just the way in which we are, I suppose, are using them here. And the toolkit itself offers guidance around engagement and and good practice, hopefully, around engagement and provides guidance for those interested in incorporating some of these tools, these future thinking tools into their practice, either individually or as part of a wider engagement process. And we acknowledge and recognise that they will work differently in different contexts contexts and that they are open to being kind of refined and improved. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, we draw um, again embedded in the toolkit. We, we, it's not just a futures thinking approach, which is very much at the, the front of the the, the process, but also under it is underpinned or in, interlinked with kind of deliberative and participatory processes too and forms of engagement where participatory approaches, um, I suppose, focus on widening participation, bringing more people in. They emphasise inclusion, empowerment and direct engagement, while more deliberative approaches tend to give greater weight to um, respectful discussions that are informed and that are to an extent reason, reason giving in that they rely on maybe facts the rely on fact and um, look to the future and the considerations of others needs but both approaches argue for communities and citizens having a more central role in developing responses and with with these we these processes linking in with the futures thinking approach we um, suggest some guiding principles to our to the engagements and the tools that are outlined in the in the pro in the toolkit and these are around inclusion ensuring diversity of um, background experience lived experience and perspectives uh, equality in that it's one thing to bring people to a table it's another to make sure that their voices are heard and that they are facilitated in in contributing and then this idea as well of considered judgment that you know that visions that recommendations um, should 
should be again referring to fact, looking to the future and taking into consideration the needs of others. And if I could have the next slide, please. So these principles, I suppose, underpinned um, the engagement process that we outline here and indeed the engagement process that led to the formation or the development of the of the toolkit. And we, it's a three stage process that we, um, I'll talk through very quickly here. We have an animation. Um, we very much invite you to have a look at it and welcome your feedback on it. So the stages are pre-community engagement, where again, um, we, we kind of suggesting working with communities to identify core issues that are of importance and salient to the community, as well as ensuring a kind of recruiting an inclusive mix of participants. Then moving on to what the, the workshops, which we, um, which in, in the case of the, of our own work um, and the development of the toolkit and which we suggest are deliberative futures forums, which blend, you know, um, blend information, critique, um, visioning and scenario building tools, and then look to the development of visions and recommendations that are in turn fed through to civil society, policymakers and experts for further, I, I suppose, deliberation and discussion. And you see at the heart of this, uh, a feedback and an evaluation loop. Um, so, uh, um, if I could have the next couple of slides, please. Um, so we have been very fortunate in our work, the work that we have done, we collaborated um, with communities in Athlone and Ballincollig, and these were the Deliberative Future Workshops um, where we met with each community on two separate weekends to co-develop our research and, and this toolkit. And uh, we acknowledge that we are indebted to them in this in this collaborative work, both in Athlone, which is in the centre of Ireland, and in Ballincollig, which is on the next slide, um, which is not too far from those of us who happen to be here in Cork this evening. And um, uh, you, you will see some photographs of how the, these, the participants in the communities engaged with the tools. And I'm very pleased to say that we have members joining us here tonight. And um, we also um, collaborated um, with others, so with stakeholders, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, with stakeholders, with uh, thought leaders and experts, again, as part of the development of the toolkit and again, as part of that third stage to develop that third stage within the wider engagement process that is um, kind of highlighted in that um, in the in the image. So at this stage, what I will do is I'm going to pass over to my colleague, Dr. Alexandra Reves and indeed Dr. Fionn Rogan, um, and they will talk you through the um, the various tools and how they have been used. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Alexandra Revesh, uh, and uh, I hope my internet works today because uh, I, I live in a rural area and sometimes is, is a little bit unstable, so I hope it stays. Um, so I have worked as a senior postdoctoral researcher in the Imagining 2050 project, and I have actually helped organize the launch today. So I really hope everything goes according to plan, that it's informative, and I particularly, you know, wish to, uh, uh, um, I, I hope that you all feel welcome here uh, this evening. So I'm going to give a very brief outline of the toolkits visioning and scenario tools, uh, and they're tools that support the development of uh, future-oriented thinking, like uh, Cloda has mentioned, but they also tap into a sort of collective imagination to promote new ways of exploring the challenges that we face as a society. So the tools draw on visualization, storytelling, and sometimes even multimedia to stimulate dialogue and to stimulate exchange. And they also provide, I suppose, the opportunity to share this knowledge in a new way that is less focused on text and numbers as we academics are used to, to, to sort of engage with. And this is more focused on the visual aspect of communication. So we drew from very different areas of expertise uh, in visualization, responding to a growing interest in finding new ways of doing co-produced and engaged research. And the goal is to share these tools as a way of enable uh, exchange, dialogue and communication for communities and by communities. 
Um, so these are not new tools, as already mentioned. We are an interdisciplinary team, and we were fortunate to draw from this richness to develop and to bring together these tools. We had graphic designers, Think Visual, who brought in their expertise on visualization. We had energy modelers and adaptation researchers from the Marai and research centers and from Queen's University Belfast as well, bringing in techniques that they have been using in a number of other projects. So the more innovative component, I suppose, of the tools is placing them within a deliberative participatory process and looking in more depth at some of the ways in which they can help gain insightful knowledge about local community issues with emphasis on future oriented solutions. So the first tool that we have here is sense making, and this is basically a tool that explores how people define and sustain meaning around a particular issue. It's uh, very useful to explore areas that are complex or new, and you can use this tool to identify anchors of meaning, explore their role as empowering or disempowering anchors for, for change. For instance, when we did this, this exercise in Athlone, we saw that uncertainty was quite a common anchor of meaning linked to climate change, which arguably leads to um, ambiguity uh, and inaction. It is also uh, helpful in terms uh, of anticipating emerging controversies, knowledge gaps, and perhaps even to scrutinize changes of, of meaning over time. So, so Jer, if you can move on the slide, please. So this is just some photos of the process. Uh, it's a rel relatively easy tool to implement, uh, and it's also adaptable to the online environment, look, uh, using apps such as Mentimeter to you know, create word clouds live uh, uh, with, with communities. Um, so moving on to the next slide, please. So the second tool is empathy mapping. It was originally introduced by our graphic designers, Becky and Naomi. Essentially, empathy mapping is a human-centered tool which asks participants to move beyond their own experience and worldviews and consider other contexts, points of views and situations. It's a very intuitive tool uh, and it's easy to implement as well. Uh, people are asked to develop a persona and consider their hopes, their fears, uh, their concerns and resources and in terms of future challenges related to climate change. Uh, the empathy maps we generated were very rich and varied. For example, we had Alex, a young person whose life paths had been considerably disrupted due to climate change and, you know, who is now growing up in a period of growing social unrest, uncertainty and inequality. We had Jim Bob, the farmer, who struggles to keep pace with more stringent environmental regulations, more extreme weather conditions and highly complex supply chain dynamics. And we also had Hope, a person living with disabilities and struggling to maintain her independent living stat status and accessing critical services. So this was really interesting in terms of trying to, to look at climate change, you know, beyond our own uh, uh, lived experience. So if we could move on to the next slide. Again, that's just an image uh, of the process. Uh, there's Alex there. Uh, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, Jer. So then we have storyboarding, which has a long history with prof professionals in filmmaking and comics. It's a sort of a prototyping technique that is very useful to help break down complex issues uh, and to explore system interactions. The methodology is very flexible and it allows the opportunity to develop context rich future oriented narratives using a blank sort of template which breaks down a narrative into smaller components and people fill in this sort of uh, blank uh, template. Jerry, if you could move on the slide. So it's, it's very useful storyboarding because it combines words with images uh, to help generate a storyline, but it can be a messy process uh, because it requires dialogue in, in order to develop a, short, a shared storyline among the group. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of micro decisions and, and dialogue that, you know, that make this process very interesting uh, as well from a deliberative standpoint. So moving on to the uh, final tool I'll be presenting. Um, so this tool is community mapping, and this is widely used uh, and a very useful uh, tool for engaging local communities in climate action. 
Community maps provide a visual representation of what communities often consider to be their place, and it helps develop a common understanding of local assets, of local vulnerabilities, uh, the siting of new developments and technologies, uh, uh, and in terms of empowering communities to look for change in, in, their, in their doorstep. Uh, if you could move on the slide, please, there, Chair. So we used bespoke maps that were generated by our team member, Amy Dozier from Marai Institute, which were very helpful uh, and made this a very engaging and visually pleasing experience. Most people engaged with this tool easily. However, it does require sort of hands-on facilitation to ensure the process is deliberative and it captures the views and knowledge of different people. So, so that is my contribution and I'll hand over to Fionn. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, and hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here and see so many people online. So I'll talk about two tools that we used uh, and are part of this toolkit. So the first one is our audience poll exercise. This was a very powerful but very simple uh, tool to engage our individuals in a group discussion around energy choices. And it helped us make the link between individual decisions and then societal outcomes. The format of the tool was that we, we developed some simple questions beforehand and we, we asked the, the audience these questions. Um, but the answers to, to these questions uh, led to an awful lot of um, rich discussion. So we ran this exercise by first presenting a big picture context um, topic uh, on, on some climate issues. So this was often an energy issue, so we would talk about Ireland's energy, our transport energy, or our electricity, or our heat energy, where we are now, and where we need to be in, in, in 10 years time, in 2030. And that's a very stark contrast when we look at where we are now and where we are in the future. Sometimes those perspectives can be disempowering, people can feel anxiety. So in this exercise, we changed focus from the, the national big picture perspective. And we asked our participants in the room how do you commute now? Uh, and we did this, uh, this was on the transport topic, we asked them how they commuted. We asked them via a, a smartphone app, and uh, we used a, a, a tool called Slido, but there are many uh, such tools, and people answered this question on their phone, and then we displayed the results overhead. And then we asked the same question again, how will you commute in 10 years time? And in both of these instances, we compared the, the group's preference for how, you know, how they commute now and how they will commute in 10 years, to the national picture now and the national picture of where we need to be in 10 years. And this set the scene then for a very rich discussion around people's lives and, and the actual practices of how they used energy. So we were grounding the, the discussions of, of, of energy and climate change in, in people's daily lives and in people's daily practices. And this facilitated more real discussion, but people could make connections as well um, between for example, transport uh, and residential and you know, settlement patterns and commuting patterns uh, and the, the, the degree to which people have freedom to make choices and, and are enabled. Um, uh, and, so, and we explored the, 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 the reasons behind people's choices as well. And this discussion led to un, unexpected um, consequences as well. We, for example, we, we saw that a lot of people said they would drive electric vehicles in the future, but we realized also that this would mean less walking in the future, and then there were health uh, outcomes from this. So the, the facilitator's job with this exercise was to, to conduct the polls, but to really facilitate discussion and to, to encourage people to, to listen to each other. So that the audience are, are participating in a discussion and they're listening to each other, and they're not just consulting an expert and, and, and looking for expert views. Um, and we, we shifted from a kind of a top-down to a bottom-up perspective. Instead of asking which technologies do we need, it was how do we use energy and what, how should we use energy for it to be sustainable? Um, on the next slide uh, is one of the, the um, this is some of the sets of uh, the questions that we asked. So you know, how do you travel? Uh, and then how will you travel in, in 10 years time? So on the next slide, uh, this is the, the second um, uh, tool that I'll talk about. So this is uh, uh, developing recommendations from the outcomes of some of our engagement events. And we did this via a ballot paper, but the questions um, emerged from the discussion over the weekend. So we were listening in as, as organizers to the discussions and, and the kind of 
topics that were coming back. And near the end of the, the activity, we we passed out draft ballots and we, we got all our participants to develop the questions, to refine them more and to, to add or, or, or to reduce them. And this was a very empowering process to, to be asking the participants in the event, what questions would they like the other, you know, to hear the results from for everybody. And this also led to one of our, our outcomes from the uh, these workshops because we, we generated a list of recommendations um, and, and these were um, uh, kind of built on the some of the, the learnings that people had from the activity. Um, and, and on our next slide uh, you'll see uh, so, so that we we uh, got the results from these ballot papers through the, the, the private ballot box because we, uh, we throughout the, the activities and through this toolkit, we, we aimed for a mix of activities which were kind of group discussions where everybody was engaging, but also facilitating private uh, kind of decisions and private reflection too. And uh, kind of the ballot box um, certainly facilitates this. On the next slide uh, is the an overview of the participatory evaluation. So we've presented a number of tools that we used to engage with uh, different communities. But we had to listen um, to those communities as well, not just in the activities, but at the end uh, of the, the weekend, because we were we were developing these tools. We wanted to, to learn what was working uh, and we wanted to, to really understand how people were, uh, what they were getting from the from the activities. Um, and we, we had, I suppose, two approaches here. We we had specific questions that we were looking for feedback on, but we also had an open ended evaluation uh, format because we had our own expectations as, as organizers, but people who participated in our event, they had their own expectations and we weren't sure if those expectations were the same as ours. So with the open-ended evaluation, we were able to, to learn more about what people were expecting from the, from the activities and um, um, what they could learn. And that feedback helped us to, to refine the, um, the, the toolkit as well. So I'll wrap up there. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Fionn. So uh, I'm conscious that we're we're running a little over time because we started a little bit late, but uh, I just wanted to put a slide there just to give you a sense of the range of different uh, disciplines, research centres and so on that have been involved uh, in, in Imagining 2050, ranging from the Department of Sociology and Criminology, uh, the SFI uh, Marai Centre for Marine and Renewable Energy, the Environmental Research Institute, uh, also colleagues in uh, Queen's University Belfast in the School of Natural and Built Environment. Uh, of course, Think Visual, who, who are with us today, um, and indeed Processing Chemical Engineering. But I just want to finish briefly just on um, this slide. And it's really to acknowledge the, the research participants who took part in Imagining 2050. Uh, because it did involve uh, quite a commitment in terms of, of time and, and interest and it was actually a process of co-creation to get to the point where we had the toolkit. We're very grateful to have uh, ongoing support from the EPA uh, Advisory Committee and Imagining 2050 was actually co-funded by the Environmental Protection Agency and the Sustainable Energy Authority of, of Ireland. And again, some of our um, uh, advisory committee are, are here today. So um, in addition, we have uh, you know, quite a range of different organisations that are listed on the, the slide there, and we will make the slides available to you later on um, so that you can, you can go through these and, and kind of go back through them. Um, but we have representatives from both Ballancolleg and some of the groups there, and indeed uh, from Athlone as well. Um, other people we need to acknowledge very quickly are many of the Mystery postgraduate students from UCC and from Queen's University Belfast, uh, Liz Creed from Transitions Kinsale, Glenn Smith from RI, and Chris Gaffney from the Cleaner Production Promotion Unit in UCC. So I'd like to call now on Cloda to introduce our guest speaker. Um, thanks, Chair. I'll make sure I've unmuted this time. So um, I don't think I introduced myself the last time. I'm Clodagh Harris and um, it's wonderful to see you all. It is my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening to you. Um, so it's uh, Dr. Oliver Escobar, who is a senior lecturer in public policy at the University of Edinburgh. And Oliver um, is the academic lead on democratic innovations at the Edinburgh Futures Institute. 
I suppose myself, I know Oliver's work best through his work on participatory and deliberative democracy, which has a strong focus on political inequalities and governance of the future. His work combines re research and practice to develop social and democratic innovations across various policy and community contexts. As you can see, he brings a wealth of experience and expertise to us this evening, and um, he's an incredibly busy man working both as a member of the stewarding group on the Scottish Climate Assembly and the co-developer of the research programme for the Scottish Citizens Assembly. So thank you very much, Oliver, for joining us this evening, and we really look forward to your reflections. Thanks, Claudia. I take it that you can hear me. I'm going to turn around my 10 minutes clock, so hopefully we live enough time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and, and also well done to all the speakers so far for putting up with this noise that Tim's is uh, uh, giving to us. It's interesting, it's a little bit like the equivalent of having, you know, those lecture theatres where you have a door at the front and every time someone comes in is to walk past the stage. It's a little bit like that. Um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Congratulations on the toolkit to, to the team. Um, and indeed to all the, the, the communities involved in testing it and in developing um, uh, and, and putting it to, to use. Um, I want to take the opportunity to, to reflect on three things. One, a little bit about the context for the toolkit. Um, second, about the toolkit itself. And then a little bit about uh, what's next um, on, on climate action and, and the kind of thinking and talking that we need to do and the doing as well, of course. And, and I know that we are, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm preaching to the converted here, probably in terms of uh, being on board, understanding what's at stake with the climate crisis. Uh, but arguably, we do we have reached a point where we do need to keep reminding ourselves of of the broader picture and the connection between the climate the climate crisis and the crisis of democracy, which I don't think features enough in our conversations about climate. Uh, and of course, conversations, which is the heart of uh, the toolkit, um, enabling conversations, um, conversations are at the heart of everything. Sometimes, um, you know, we forget that everything we've ever done as humans, we've done it through conversations and organizations, institutions, communities, are just conversations that have been going on for some time. So conversation is at the heart of everything. And I'm, I'm a child of the of the 80s. So I grew up in the 90s. I remember the, the conventions in Rio de Janeiro on climate and biodiversity. And I remember, you know, the, the talk about sustainability. And in just 30 years, we've gone from talking about sustainability to talking about survival. It is quite an indictment um, in, in our institutional system and in the kind of economies we've built that after 60 years of the environmental movement, um, we're still beginning, just beginning to, to bring some urgency to this agenda. Um, of course, all of this is based on the fundamental truth that as a species, our power has grown faster than our wisdom. Uh, we've built a world on the back of a persistent systemic disregard for the natural world and other humans, future generations, people who are right now at the front lines of climate catastrophe all over the world, large population displacements. This is just the beginning, of course. Um, and I'll, I, I, I want to come to this idea of, of how to be better ancestors, this idea that the philosopher Roman Narik has been putting forward. And this notion of democratic myopia, which Graham Smith and others talk about, this notion that uh, short-term thinking is hardwired into our democratic institutions, especially those that are dependent on electoral cycles. Uh, and we are in the middle of a democratic recession. We have been now for 10 years, um, but the climate crisis has the potential to, to take us to democratic collapse. And I think Frank Fisher makes a persuasive uh, argument on this, showing how there are scenarios in which the first thing that is going to start to fall down in the domino effect of the climate crisis is going to be democratic systems all over the world. So, um, if we want to avoid uh, tyranny tomorrow, um, we, we need to address tyranny now, the tyranny of short-termism. 
Um, and there are so many forces that push us to, to think short term. Um, and this is, for me, the, the fundamental value of this toolkit is, is the futures thinking that is built into it. And futures thinking, um, a few years ago, there was there was a lot of momentum around it. Uh, and so I'm glad that you're blending it to, with the insights of deliberative democracy. Futures thinking is under strain for, uh, for, you know, because there are lots of forces in life, um, fast life, quick gratification, solidarity deficits, the, the growing cult of selfishness and self-interest, built obsolescence as a key principle of our industrial strategies and, and industrial work, um, and, and indeed a diabolical mass of ever-growing disposable trinkets. So we really um, have a challenge in our hands. And often people, um, sometimes I, I often hear people complain about apathy and public apathy, and people don't want to have these conversation, conversations. But of course, in your experience, clearly, through the Imagining 50, uh, 2050 uh, program, and in the many conversations that, that we're having um, in the UK and in Scotland in communities and at national level, it is clear that people want to be engaged. So um, pu public apathy is a myth, it's a convenient myth for an institutional system that has become really good at generating apathy on an industrial scale. Um, and to me, it all boils down, and this is where I'm coming to the toolkit, um, to, to the fundamental question, which is what kind of citizen are we inviting citizens to be? Um, followers, spectators, bystanders, complainers, or thinkers, collaborators, problem solvers, co-producers. Uh, and I think Ireland, of course, is, 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 is leading on democratic innovation through assemblies and, and other processes. And, and I think most people in this room will agree that democracy has to be more than electoral democracy and politics more than um, party politics. We need a multiplication of spaces for community conversations that enable solidarity, creativity and action. And a lot of this is already happening. It's just that a lot of the radar of, for example, mainstream media is not quite catching it. Um, and I think that this is where Imagining 2050 uh, is, is making an important contribution. The toolkit itself, um, I love it. I love how it looks. I mean, I think people are going to um, find it very um, inspiring, inspiring and evocative. I like that it, it's been tested. I like that you've been using these tools. Uh, it does distill an awful lot of research and engagement know-how into very practical guidance. It's highly accessible, refreshingly accessible, I would say. Um, it is a wonderful resource, I think, that, that is going to travel really well across community worlds and policy worlds as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really, it nicely links individual and collective dimensions, and I really like how visual it is. Um, the, many of the methods are very tactile, um, and, and this is great because there is a dominance of the spoken word in deliberative democracy, which doesn't cater to the variety of uh, styles and preferences of engagement and learning that people uh, have. Um, I also like that, that it really puts facilitation, the craft of facilitation, facilitation skills at the heart of all of this. And this is a, a key capacity for action that we need to make sure is more distributed across society. Um, you know, it, it is crucial in terms of tackling power inequalities. It, it's, you know, if we create participatory spaces uh, that don't live up to deliberative standards, then we might just be replicating the very inequalities that are out there in society that then get into the room and shape the recommendations, priorities and decisions that come out of the room. Um, and we often think it, take it for granted that if you put people together in a room, good conversations will simply happen. But of course, many people here will know and will um, have experienced the opposite. Um, uh, good conversations require careful facilitation. And, um, you know, uh, I, I, I can imagine some skeptics um, thinking, well, OK, so this is just about more talk, but what we need is more action. And I get that point. And I'm myself a little bit impatient as well. Uh, but I think those things go together. They have to go together because talk without action um, may be toothless, but action without talk can be mindless. And we need to be careful. I also like there's a, a, a drawing where Policymakers in, in the toolkit are represented by a squirrel holding a nut. 
And it reminded me of the uh, the movie Ice Age. There's something quite compelling about what happens to that squirrel and that mat, the holding on to power and to resources. Um, let me finish with some concluding reflections. Um, you know, there, there was one of the most memorable lines. We had a, a commission in Scotland called the Commission on Strengthening Local Democracy, and it concludes something quite obvious, but that often we forget. And it is the it's not institutions and governments that empower communities. It is communities that empower institutions. Uh, and this has to be founded on substantial community participation and new forms of uh, distributed collective intelligence and leadership. And to me, um, we cannot have a participatory democracy without having a more participatory economy. So we really need to bring these things together. We need to get beyond economies of scale and accumulation towards economies of scope and imagination. And this is what some people are talking uh, about in terms of community economies. There's some interesting work emerging there, and I think this toolkit will be useful in that space as well. Uh, the toolkit touches on digital infrastructure. Of course, life has become more digital, and therefore um, digital infrastructure uh, is going to be crucial. Uh, but uh, And the toolkit makes this point, I think, and, and makes it well. This is not about uh, Twitter and Facebook. Those are old-fashioned. Uh, digital platforms. We need to embrace the new generation of platforms that have been built for dialogue and deliberation. And um, climate anxiety, as we know, is growing and people are going to need more and more spaces where they can come together uh, to talk and act. Um, we already have a mental health uh, crisis at a global level. Um, the aftermath of the pandemic is going to be really challenging on that. And, you know, uh, conversations are going to become more crucial than ever. These have to be inclusive, productive, meaningful, and they need to cut across communities of place, practice, interest, and identity. And I think this toolkit is a wonderful addition to the toolbox of change makers everywhere. So, um, surely part of the cure for democratic myopia is community-led futures thinking and action. I think this toolkit is going to help with that. Um, and uh, hopefully at the heart of it um, is going to be this notion that we need to care about power inequalities and how that hinders our capacity to act on climate. We need to decentralize and share power, devolve power uh, as much as possible. And then try to create the new spaces and processes and networks, and some of them are already out there, but we need to multiply them and boost them so that we accomplish that very challenging um, thing, uh, which which is perhaps the, the biggest challenge of, of right now, which is how do we do, how do we enable short-term action that is based on long-term thinking? I think that's the challenge. I think this toolkit is a wonderful addition to the toolbox that can help us to have those conversations and try and, and make things happen faster. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. There's a lot of food for thought in, in, in that response. Uh, so uh, Paul Bolger and Evan Boyle are monitoring the chat there and they're going to feed in some questions. So we'll use the chat function in the first instance just to make sure people get uh, an equal airing uh, and then maybe move on to, um, you know, using the hands up, hands up function as well. And again, just to just to say that we have members of both the Banacolic community that were involved and also the Athlone community as well, as well as many other communities around the country who have already begun to work with the, the toolkit. So, Paul, would you like to um, pose the first question there, please? Sure, sure. Uh, Chair, before you proceed, do you want to turn off the recording? Uh, absolutely. Um, Alex, can you stop recording? Good save, thank you. 